Hey everyone, Matt Brunig here. A lot of commenters have been asking me to uh, do some videos about philosophical topics. Uh, way back in the day when I first started writing online, I used to write almost exclusively about philosophy, though in the last, I don't know, seven, eight years, I really have written very, very little about it. Uh, nonetheless, I'm on a new platform, so maybe if I uh, recycled some of my own philosophical content in video form, that could be interesting to people. So to start my first philosophical video, um, I thought it would be worthwhile jumping into what I think of as the most common real life, like real human beings, not philosophers or intellectuals, but real life human beings that you run into. Uh, what they're, the most common objection people have to um, socialist economies, um, to the welfare state, to what we call redistribution, right? To, to creating an equal society. Uh, what's the most common thing you hear from real life people when you talk about that? Um, and I would say the most common thing you hear is an invocation of what in a philosophical writing we would call uh, a principle of just desserts. So I'm not going to... Uh, so just desserts is basically the idea that, hey, uh, l let me put it in real life terms. People say, hey, I worked for that. That's mine. I worked for it. I earned it. Shame on you for taking it away from me and giving it to someone else. It's this concept of makers versus takers, right? People who produce things versus people who take things without producing them, and so on and so forth. And the basic idea of this, um, though it doesn't you know, get fully articulated this way, obviously, when you're talking to a real-life person who's just kind of trying to work through their philosophical intuitions as opposed to you know, writing an elegant theory, is... There's the idea that, you know, people should get what they put in, right? Uh, if we think of uh, socialism as uh, the old Marxist slogan, you know, from each according to their ability to each according to their need, uh, the idea of labor desert is uh, that uh, from each according uh, to their labor to each according to their labor, right? <laughs> Whatever you produce with your work, you should get back to you. And if other people produce less than that, then they should get less than you. If other people produce more than that, then they should get more to you, right? So it's a, it's a pitch for what uh, Nozick would call a pattern distribution, right? Where the pattern of the distribution of resources, especially like consumptive resources in society, you pattern that distribution to match underlying work effort and underlying productivity, Right, So the most productive person gets the most amount of stuff. The least productive person gets the least amount of stuff. And we follow that pattern up and down the distribution of productivity. Right, um, And there's a reason why <laughs> this does not tend to be what you see in intellectual arguments against egalitarianism or socialism or the welfare state or redistribution or whatever. And that is that this argument is very, very untenable. It's, it's the weakest argument by far, um, even though it is the most prevalent argument among society. So that is a kind of an interesting phenomenon, I suppose. Um, but let me walk you through the problems with this argument, which are tremendous, uh, to say the least. So for starters here, uh, I've put up a little. Uh, I've put up a little flow chart, uh, similar uh, as you can see to the uh, uh, flow chart technology I was using in my uh, piece about Karl Marx and uh, shareholder, or rather, um, Karl Marx and joint stock companies. But this is um, essentially a depiction of what is called the production function, or the sometimes called the neoclassical production function, though there are different kinds of production functions. But the basic idea here is, in an economy, you have, roughly speaking, four inputs. This is how people talk about it. We can get into some alternative uh, depictions of this. But you have, roughly speaking, four inputs that go into production, right? So you have nature, which is natural resources. Sometimes, actually, I would say typically, this is called land. But I think land is not a good... A term for it because they don't just mean land, 
They also mean anything that you get from nature, you, you know, when you're harvesting trees or you're uh, getting, uh, you're mining uh, stuff out of, the, out, of the, out of the land, I guess, technically. But it's any kind of natural resources, anything you kind of extract from nature and you put into a product, that is an input into production, right? Number two is technology. Um, and technology is in quotes here because it's a little bit wishy-washy. This factor is frequently called total factor productivity, or sometimes it's called multi-factor productivity. Um, it is, in statistical terms, uh, the residual after you've counted for nature, after you've accounted for capital, and after you've counted for labor, this is just everything else. So it's, it's really everything that cannot be explained by one of these three factors. And I think generally people will chalk this up to technology. Or sometimes you'll hear technology and knowledge. But it's, it's that kind of thing, this Im immaterial uh, innovation in ideas and productive processes, things like that, that can make you more productive even without increasing the amount of work you do, without increasing the amount of natural resources you extract, or increasing the amount of capital that you put into it. Just becoming more innovative in the way that you produce um, can increase output. And then uh, next we have capital. Now, sometimes people will combine nature and capital together, and you'll just have capital. So, um, y you know, it'll be, there'll be essentially two factors of production, two inputs. You have capital and labor, and then capital includes the idea of nature. And then usually only many, many years later does someone come in and say, actually, there's a third one or at least or a fourth one, which is technology. But anyways, capital in this telling is going to be... Um, Things like machines and factories and buildings and infrastructure, these things that we produce with labor and nature, right? Like a, a machine, that a robot that you use in a, in a car factory was produced with natural inputs and labor inputs. But those uh, labor and nature inputs create this uh, robot, and then that robot becomes an input into another productive process, right? So we... And some people fight this, but we give it its own factor of production, even though it what it is actually itself a product of labor and nature. Like you can see where the socialists go with this. They say, hey, 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 don't call capital a separate factor of production. That's just allowing the capitalists to put their foot in the door and say we are owed something. What capital goods are created by labor and nature? A capitalist doesn't create them. There's nothing nothing else going on here than labor and nature. Um, but this is how it's typically presented, and, and I'm not trying to fight that fight right now um, for the purposes of this video. So the last input here is labor. That's the most obvious one. That's, in fact, uh, the people who invoke this. They seem to think it's all labor. <laughs> uh, invoke uh, just desserts, right? The idea that I work, you know, I should earn what I work, and I should, you know, get what I produce. Labor. People go out and they do stuff, right? You mix all this stuff together in various forms, and you get output, which are goods and services in society. Pretty simple, right? And I didn't invent this, obviously. Um, this is very standard textbook uh, production function stuff you'll get if you, if you take a macroeconomics course in, in college or maybe even high school, you're going to get this. The first person, I, this I think is the first person who ever stated it precisely this way, um, but I might be wrong. Uh, you know, you never know. Maybe someone came before him. The first person I think who ever stated it this, this way was John Stuart Mill in his book, uh, Principles of Political Economy. We see right here in uh, ch chapter 7, uh, par section 1, um, he, he has this to say. We have seen that the essential requisites of production are three, labor, capital, and natural agents— the term capital includes all external and physical requisites which are product of labor. The term natural agents, all those which are not. The increase in production, therefore, depends on the properties of these three elements. It is a result of the increase of either the elements themselves or of their productiveness. This is kind of a key thing that I think he might be the first one to state very clear. Now, it's interesting. He's saying there's three elements of production, but then he adds really a fourth one, which is the productiveness of those three elements together. 
that gets us this prong right here, technology or what's sometimes called total factor productivity or multi-factor productivity. All right, so you get the basic gist here. We got four inputs in and we got these outputs out. Now, if you are someone who thinks, hey, uh, people should get what they, what they produce, right? People should get what they earn, right? Whatever you make, whatever you contribute to the output of the economy, that's what you should get paid back. If that's your view, and, and that therefore redistribution and the welfare state and socialism and egalitarianism is all misguided. It's all essentially a form of theft. You're stealing from the makers, the people who actually produce the stuff. You're stealing from them because you're taking something from them that they produced, okay? So under that view, the idea here is that these inputs create this output, but then also the distribution of this output should basically flow back this way, right? All right and this is how, you know, in a, a very rough sense, you know, how it's supposed to work, right? Now, of course, these are just all the inputs together. Within labor, of course, you have in the United States over 150 million workers. So you have other 150 million different laborers. And capital, of course, we've got hundreds of millions of different machines and little units of capital and technology. Like all these things can be broken up into tons and tons and tons of little pieces. Here, we've just broken them up into four and aggregated these broad groups um, together. Um, but... Basically, these inputs create these outputs, and then in a capitalist system, in theory, whatever contribution each input had to the output is also how much that input gets paid. That's its distributive share, and the desertists are supposed to love this, but here's the problem. If you're someone who thinks each person should get that which they produce, let's go right down the list here. Nature. Let's start with nature. That's a big input. Everything you consume that has any kind of physical characteristics in it has nature contained inside of it. This computer has nature contained inside of it. All sorts of metals and stuff were mined to produce this stuff. The glass, you know, there's sand, there's pla I mean, all this stuff is made of material, and that material had to come from nature. But nobody produces nature. Nobody produces nature. I don't produce land. You don't produce land. I don't produce uh, coal, uh, rare earth metals. You don't produce coal or rare earth metals. You don't produce gas. You don't produce oil. You don't produce waves that produce hydroelectricity. You don't produce the sun, <laughs> which powers my home because of my solar panels. I don't produce it either. All of these uh, basic resources that are coming from nature are unproduced. In fact, in, natural, in national accounting, the, these inputs are usually called non-produced assets. No one produces them. But if no one produces them, then how can you get paid for them? If you are someone who believes you should get what you produce, then no one is owed the amount of production, the share of production that's coming from nature, no one is owed it, right? And you could, you could kind of go one of two ways with this observation. The first way you could go with this observation is to say, since all physical objects include natural inputs that nobody produced, then nobody can own any physical objects, right? Because there's pieces of that object that you didn't produce. Neither you, not that you didn't produce it, nobody produced them. They're completely unproduced, so nobody ever had a legitimate claim to them, right? That would be kind of the extreme version, is to say, look, every physical thing you have is infected <laughs> with this input that no one has any rightful claim over because no one actually worked to produce it. It just came to us from, from nature, right? That's the kind of extreme version. The less extreme version of it is to say, there is at least some portion <laughs> of everything you own that does not belong to you. That does not belong to anyone. That just comes from nature. And so that portion, how do you distribute that according to productivity, according to labor, according to how much I contribute? You can't. So at least this, I mean, I want to say at least because you could go a number of ways with it, but it seems like at least this has to belong to everyone, right? At least this has to belong to everyone, right? And, and you know, people will fight over how much of the output we can attribute to nature. It's kind of an absurd fight, of course, because if you remove nature from the uh, inputs, everything else collapses and we all die, right? So like in, a, some, in some sense, nature is, is, is necessary for all of it. But how much would we say? 10%, 20%, 30%? 
of all of all out, output is attributable in some sense to a natural input. Um, and 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 it's important to say nature here also is going to include uh, one of our uh, most devilish problems these days, which is land rent. And in fact, if people are familiar with Henry George, he proposed um, taxing land rent at 100% in order to bring land rent into public uh, control so that we could all benefit from it, blah, 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 blah. But if you live in a center city, anywhere in especially the developed world, you've seen rents escalate and escalate and escalate and escalate. And what's happening is the land, the space in that city is becoming way, way, way more valuable and the people who happen to own it are generating massive amounts of return from owning that space. And that space, they didn't make that space, right? They didn't, no, nobody that I know of made the land in Manhattan, right? Or the space in Manhattan. Because it's not just the land as in the physical, like, little piece, but also the space, the vertical space up and down in Manhattan. Nobody made that space. Yet that space is extremely valuable, and whoever happens to own it gets a huge share of the output of our economy. Um, and this is something that's been known for a long time, right? Uh, from the very beginning, <laughs> people broke up inputs this way. Technology didn't come till later. They broke up these inputs these way, this way with nature, capital, and labor, and they said, this nature bit is basically theft, right? Anyone who's getting money from nature right, because they're selling some mineral rights that they have or because they're renting some land that they have, that's basically theft, right? Um, and in fact, we see here this quote from um, Adam Smith. This is from his book, Wealth of Nations, book one, chapter six, famous quote of his. As soon as the land of any country has become private property, the landlords, like all other men, love to reap where they have never sowed and demand a rent even for its natural produce. Reap where they have not sowed. Get income without working. Right? They didn't earn this. They didn't produce the land, but they demand a rent even for its natural produce. What? kinds of produce, the wood of the forest, the grass of the field, and all the fruits of the earth, which, when land was in common, cost the laborer only the trouble of gathering them, come even to him to have an additional price fixed upon them. He must then pay for the license to gather them, and must give up to the landlord a portion of what his labor either collects or produces. This portion, or what comes to the same thing, the price of this portion, constitutes the rent of the land, and in the price of the greater part of the commodity makes a third component part, the other two parts being labor and capital, right? So there's your first problem. This input, it doesn't fit with labor dessert. There's no way to, uh, to bring it into a theory of, of deservingness based upon how much you contribute with your work, right? Okay, let's move on to factor number two, technology. Now, as I mentioned at the top, this doesn't come in as a like separate factor of production. I say until John Stuart Mill mentioned it kind of in passing in that book. Um, but I think formally it really became a thing that people appreciated uh, in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, Robert Solo wrote a paper. I probably should have popped that up in the tabs there. He wrote a paper. I forgot what it was called. I think it was in the 1950s where he says, look, we can bring in this other factor of technology. And in fact, if you go now look back into the history of our accounts, what we find is that it is growth in technology that that's pretty much driving everything, right? It's not that we're, we are adding some na additional natural inputs. We are adding some additional capital inputs. And we are adding additional labor inputs. But even once we've accounted for all of these new inputs, right, more land, more labor, more capital, even as we've kind of just stacked those up, if we then go look over here at output, we find that output far exceeds, or I should say the growth in our output far exceeds the growth in the inputs of nature, capital, and labor, right? And that excess has to be explained by technology. It has to be explained by this other factor, which is causing these inputs to become more productive, right? So we can squeeze more out of them, not add more, but squeeze more out of what we already have, and it's technology that drives that. 
And here's actually a fun paper from the, uh, I tried to look at some papers. There's a lot of papers that try to figure out essentially what does technology look like in like how, how much of historical growth has been driven by technology as opposed to increasing capital, increasing labor and that kind of thing. This is all Robert Shackleton <laughs> at the CBO. Um, and this, again, like I said, there are dozens and dozens of these papers. And in some ways, these papers are all kind of silly because people are really trying to prove like definitively how much is going to each factor. And really, that's not an, that's not, it's almost like a conceptually impossible thing to do. But nonetheless, here we have this little intro, right? Economists have long found that they can explain only a portion of economic growth by the growth of inputs to production, such as the number of hours worked or the amount of capital used. The unexplained or residual portion, which presumably reflects advances in production technologies and processes, is conventionally attributed to all of the production factors together and is referred to as total factor productivity growth. Over the past century or more, this is for the U.S., Gains in TFP have accounted for well over half the growth in measured U.S. labor productivity, output per hour of work. That is, they have contributed more to the measured growth of labor productivity than has the growth in the amount of capital per worker, and they are likely to be critical for future economic growth as well. So over the last century, he's talking about 100, 100 years or more, it is technology, technological developments that is causing us to produce more and more and more and more stuff. And he, the paper is actually neat because he kind of, there's a, like a little historical narrative in here as well about what are the technologies we're talking about, right? So railroads and telegraphs before the 1870s. Then we get electromagnetism, electricity, internal combustion engines. We get uh, uh, chemical um, innovations um, on and on here, electricity, uh, like I said, in petrochemicals, especially fertilizers for agricultures, telecom, telephones, radios, television, all of these things are increases in technology and they allow us to produce more goods and services, right? But now here's the question, who should get the increment of the total output that is attributable to technology? We already went through nature. Nobody produces nature. So nobody is entitled to the product of nature. Technology is a little bit different because people produce technology. There are human beings who sit down and they come up with these new technologies, right? Uh, electricity innovations were, were big, you know. Uh, who, Tesla was, was big on electricity innovations. The phone, Alexander Graham Bell, right? Um, you can go down the line, right? And, and in fact, these are recent innovations. Let's go back. All of these innovations sort of stand on the shoulders of the innovations that came before us. Who invented algebra? Right, I think that was uh, that, that that was that came out of the Middle East or something like that. Who invented geometry? Wasn't that those were the Greeks or something? Right, um, all of this math had to be invented over the years. Calculus had to be invented. All sorts of developments in physics and material science. All of these things, these innovations, they had to be invented, and there were real people who sat down and worked them out. But here's the problem: those people are dead. Those people don't exist anymore. Right, So you could make a claim that would say, hey, whoever invented electricity, if you can even describe a person as being like the singular inventor of electricity, whoever invented electricity, he, he is owed oh, so much, right? I mean, look how much productivity that invention created. But he doesn't, he's not alive anymore. Those people don't exist anymore. All of the technology and knowledge that runs our economy and that accounts for the vast majority of what we produce was produced, was created by people who are dead. So who then is owed that part of the national output, right? If we put all the output in one bucket, right? And the first thing that we do is we cut off a slice and we say that slice is from nature. That part of the, of the bucket of all the stuff we produce, that came from nature. Well, no one's owed that. Then we have this other slice. This slice is actually the biggest slice, right? Maybe it's 50, 60, 70% of the bucket. We go, that came from technological innovations, people who figured out how to be more productive um, using special techniques and math and all this kind of stuff. We take that part of the bucket. Now we ask ourselves, who's owed that? Who should get that 50 to 60% of the goods and services we produce each year? Who? 
Who should get it? The people who create the innovations are dead. No one alive has a rightful claim to that based on their own contribution. You didn't invent electricity. <laughs> you didn't invent algebra. You didn't invent calculus. You didn't invent any of these things that are the basis for the massive output that we produce each year. You didn't invent any of that. And if we sucked, that all, the, if we sucked all that out of the economy and said, nope, you're not allowed to use any knowledge or innovation that, that someone else came up with, there would be basically nothing left, right? So... What do we do there? I don't know. Labor dessert has no explanation for this. Okay. Now let's move to factor number three, capital. Now I've already uh, discussed that uh, the socialists will say uh, capital is just nature and labor. <laughs> it's just, it's an output of prior uh, combinations of nature and labor. It shouldn't be treated any differently, but let, let's do treat it differently. Okay. And let's ask ourselves a few things, right? Capital, what's unique about capital is that the people who own it, they receive income without working. That, that is what makes capital capital, right? You own some capital good, and then you're effectively able to rent it out. Now, these things are mediated these, day, these days through companies, and people generally would think about owning capital as owning um, you know, financial assets. But at the, at the end of the day, right, there are real physical assets that operate in the world. Um, and in fact, the financial assets are even more like just money without working, without having to do anything or produce anything, right? But what it is to get a capital return, whether that's interest, rent, dividend, what it is to get a return on those things is precisely to get money without working. So if you're going to say, hey, I worked for this, I worked for this, I worked for this, and then hold up a dividend check that you got in the mail because you own shares of some companies and tell me you worked, you did not work for that. You did not work for that, right? A paycheck, oh, okay, maybe you worked for that. Uh, you know, a dividend check, you did not. Period, end of story, right? So the labor dessert kind of emphasis, right, where you deserve what you work for, completely blows up the capitalist. It says the capitalist is the, is the biggest parasite of all. He's pulling down roughly 30% of the national income each year without working. Of course, it's not one person. It's many people. It's spread across the society, blah, 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 blah. But the whole thing. Now, again, in saying all this, there will be people who are, I know are going to come in the comments, Patricia and Blake, Matt, if we just took everything from capital, that you know the economy would collapse and blah, blah, blah. Sure, sure. But what I'm addressing here is the philosophical rationale for why people should get the income that they get. And if the philosophical rationale, at least among a lot of people, is that you should get what you work for. Capitalists do not get what they work for. They get what they own for. They get money based on what they own. They get money based on their wealth. They don't get money based on their work. Period, end of story. Right Now, you can have some justification for doing that. It could be a utilitarian justification, which I'll get into later. It could be about freedom and voluntary processes and all this kind of shit. There's lots of things you could do to try to justify capital income, but you can't justify it by saying people should just get what they work for because capital income is not worked for by definition. The other thing is, okay, let's say you wanted to say, okay, Matt, that's just a little bit too harsh, okay? Because, yeah, sure, the return on capital is money you get for owning and investing, not money you get for working. But let's say you go out and you work and you get a paycheck and you, want, you spend half of the paycheck on food and, and housing and, you know, for consumption. And then you put the other half of the paycheck into investment. And then that um, investment generates a return. Shouldn't you, you know, that is a return on your invested labor earnings, and the labor earnings were rightfully yours. You worked for them. And so shouldn't the return kind of be, you know, rightfully yours as well? Uh, the answer, of course, is no. But e even if the answer was yes, let's, let's take that logic where it leads us, okay? Let's say I invest $100 from my labor earnings, and I get $5 back. And now you want to, let's say you want to come back and say that $5 should be yours, right? Because it was a return on your invested labor earnings and the labor earnings were rightfully yours, okay? Okay, fine. So now, and in year number two, I started with $100. In year number two, I have $100 and $5 because I have the return, right? Now let's say I reinvest that again, okay? Okay. 
Now I'm getting a return not just on the $100, right? I'm getting a return on the return. That $5 that I got returned from last year, I reinvested. And now I'm getting a return on that $5, okay? Well, that $5 was not from my work, right? So even if you want to give me one step of return and say you should get one step of return because you did invest your labor earnings, that's fine, right? But then after I'm getting a return on top of return, on top of return, on top of return, also known as compound interest, that is not return on my labor earnings. That is return on stuff that I did not work for, return on prior return. So that would need to get knocked out of your system. You'd have to tax that. Um, and, and then let's go one step further. What about um, inheritance? Right? How much is inheritance in wealth? Um, and here's a paper that was published a while ago that you know includes a good summary of the research on this. To leave or not to leave the distribution of bequest motives um, and the only thing I find interesting about this paper is the literature review. Um, and what we get here is, you know, briefly he tries to say, look, uh, the importance of uh, in bequests and other intergenerational transfers in the macro economy has been debated. Cote, Lakoff, and Summers argue that as much as 46% of household wealth is accounted for by bequests, which is inheritance. And Modigliani argues that a much smaller 17% is more accurate. And he, down here at the bottom here, and he, he talks about uh, this paper, um, Davies and Shorrock. They did their own survey. They said, look, if we look at all these papers that have flown back and forth about trying to add up the amount of inheritance, which is difficult. It requires judgment calls. We don't really have good survey data for it, whatever. When you add up all the people who have tried to do this and you kind of get like a rough average, basically 34 to 45% of all wealth in the nation as presently has been inherited, okay? So you gotta knock that shit out. We wanna knock that out? What is that gonna involve? I don't know, right? How can you claim that you are entitled not just to that wealth, which you did not produce, right? It's inherited, someone else produced it, but then also from there, you're entitled to the return on inherited wealth because then you invest it and you get return on that. It's not just return on the return on your labor earnings. Now it's return on the inherited wealth that someone else had and bequest to you. That seems like pretty obviously illegitimate. In fact, so illegitimate is inherited wealth in the context of talking about getting what you deserve and, and why you know, we shouldn't have redistribution, whatever. So illegitimate is that, that Robert Nozick, the, the ur-libertarian philosopher, late in his life, he wrote a book, um, I think it was called Philosophical, uh, I don't remember the name now, but I remember reading this book. And he had, a, he had an interesting take on inheritance where he says, um, well, look, it's kind of similar to my point about return upon return upon return. He's saying, look, if you, uh, in your life, you accumulated a bunch, of in, a bunch of wealth because of your work, right? Let's say you accumulated a million dollars in assets, right? We want to say, okay, um, yeah, if you give it to your kid when you die, your kid did not earn it, but you earned it. And surely since you earned it, you should have a right to decide how to dispose of it, right? And if that means giving it to your kid, then that means giving it to your kid. Okay, um, but here's the problem. What if your kid now gives that wealth to their grandkid, right? What if you go down a second generation of inheritance? And what he proposes is a 100% second generation inheritance tax. So the way it would work is, you know, throughout your life, you, we would keep track of everything that you inherited. Let's say you got some money from grandma, you got some money from your dad and whatever, right? And, and that all added up to you know, you know, $500,000, right? Then, then we would have attached to your name in some database somewhere that you inherited $500,000, right? And then when you die, whatever money you have in your estate, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take $500,000 off of it. So let's say you die and you have, you have you know, 1.2 million. Um, left in your state, and you're trying to give that to your kid. Well, we go, hey, okay, you have 1.2 million in your state, but you inherited 500 grand, so we're going to deduct that 500 grand. We're going to take that as a tax, and then you can only pass on the difference, which in this case would be 700 grand, right? So a 100% second generation inheritance tax. That's from the libertarian Robert Nozick, not from wild eyed socialist me.
Um, so yeah, so capital also doesn't work. <laughs> no one produces nature. Technology is produced, but the people who produce it are dead, and yet we are massively benefiting from it. In fact, it accounts for the majority of what we produce every year. Um, capital is produced actually by nature and labor, but we'll put that aside. The people who own capital uh, receive money without working. Capital itself, machines may be productive, but owning machines is not productive, right? And it's that ownership relationship that allows you to get paid uh, just because you happen to own capital, right? And then we talk about inheritance or return, right? Okay, fuck, man. Three of the inputs are just garbage, right? There's nothing we can really do to salvage the, the payments that are paid to people who own nature. We often call them landlords. From, pe from technology, we don't even make payments to technology. We just, it's just kind of randomly shit around the economy. The payments to capital can't be justified by, well, you should keep whatever you earn because they don't work. So now we have labor. Now, labor would seem like, all right, here we go. Okay. You know, it is labor dessert. It is the idea that you deserve what you labor for. So surely labor is in the clear. Surely labor is in the clear. Labor is not in the clear. <laughs> labor is in the clear, I should say, in aggregate. Though remember, what's left of labor after you've taken out nature, technology, and, and the return on cow, there's... What's left of labor really is already a very small amount. Why are you talking about, I don't know, 20% of the national income that you can really say, hey, the workers this year went out and that's how much we can really say is attributable to them. That's not attributable to thousands of years of accumulated technologies and innovations. That's not attributable to natural inputs, but just attributable to the labor this year. How much of the national economic pie can you even attribute to labor as a whole? 20%? 30%, so then we should be able to tax you by 80%. The rest of it should be taxable because you workers don't deserve it. They didn't produce these technologies or nature. That's all, you know, either unproduced or produced by someone who's not alive anymore. But, okay, let's not worry about how small labor's share should be. It would seem like, well, however small it is, at least they deserve it. At least they worked for it. Here becomes the problem here, okay? Sure, labor taken as a whole, you can say deserve it, but labor is not a, an aggregate quantity. There are people who are laborers. In fact, like I said before, over 150 million of them in the U.S., right? So how do we know how much each laborer should get, right? Let's say labor as a whole is owed 20% of the national output, you know, because the rest is attributed for up here. How much of that 20% should each of the 150 million workers get? And the idea of this, I think, is supposed to be, well, you should get what you produce, right? If you're a very productive worker, then you should get, let's say, two times the national average. And if you're an unproductive worker, you should get half the national average. It should be based on what you personally produced. But how do we know how much each particular worker contributed to the national output? How do we know? And I think usually when people talk about this, they like to use examples of people who are working by themselves. So Robinson Crusoe, who's on an island all by himself, right? he produces, and whatever he produces, you know he produced 100% of it. Right? So if you've ever seen these libertarians, they love to use examples that are like, imagine someone washed up on an island and they made, all, they made a house and they did all this stuff. Wouldn't you say that belongs to them? And, and you know, the intuition is supposed to be like, well, yeah, I guess, you know, especially if you believe that, um, you know, people are entitled to their labor. Of course, does that house not include nature? <laughs> does that house not include technology that that person remember from his old society? Put that aside. Um, we could say, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever labor was put into it was all his labor. But as soon as you add in a second worker, as soon as you start doing joint production, right, where you have a firm that has hundreds of workers, thousands of workers in it, the idea that you're going to be able to take the output that comes out of that firm and is sold to customers and be able to go, yes, that worker, he contributed exactly 0.1% of, of the total output. And so that's how much of the revenue he should get kicked back to him. The idea that you can do that is absurd, right? In certain settings, right, in certain styli stylized settings, economists will talk about the marginal productivity of labor, where they say, hey, if you, 
what if you had like a, a very clean kind of factory system and the factory was putting out widgets and in this abstract scenario you could add an hour of labor or subtract an hour of labor and when you add an hour of labor the total output you produce an extra widget and when you subtract an, an hour of labor you you produce one less widget and so now we know that the marginal productivity of one hour of labor is one widget right and those are the kind of models they create to try to be like see you could kind of isolate what an individual worker's contribution is and therefore determine what to pay them but in practice um, production processes are far too complex to allow you to do this right maybe in a factory setting designed a certain way sure but think about something like a restaurant for example you've got the people in the back of the staff who are cooking you've got the people uh, up front who are uh, you know doing uh, serving work right taking orders doing that kind of stuff you got people who come in uh, maybe after and clean the restaurant you got people who are doing accounting right administrative tasks how do you say, oh, yes, the person who's doing the books, uh, that person is definitely contributing, you know, like $50,000 a year to the restaurant's revenue. If he wasn't doing the books, the revenue would collapse, or I should say the, the restaurant would collapse, right? If you take him out from doing the books, then, then you can't keep track of anything and you wouldn't be able to pay your tax. Like everything would fall apart. Or even the thing, let's say you take the, the chef or, or let's say there's one cook in the back, right? It's a small restaurant. If that cook doesn't show up to work, then the restaurant doesn't run at all. So does that mean the cook it, it contributes 100% of the revenue? Well, no, because if the waitress didn't show up, then also, or the waiter, or, you know, then also the revenue. You, you see what I'm saying? So there's, there's no way to actually snap back and identify exactly how much each person is contributing. But here's the other rub. Even if you could very clearly say, look, if we add an hour of this kind of labor, it results in this exact amount of revenue on the, on the, on the, uh, you know, on the back end. Even if you could do that, you still would not be able to say, ah, that's what that worker produced, right? Because th there's a difference between marginal product accounting, right? When you're as a business owner saying, as an accounting matter, when I add this worker, how much stuff comes, how much more stuff comes out the, at the end of my system? and saying as a kind of value distribution matter, as a matter of, of figuring out how much each person produced, that you can say, yes, all of that extra output was literally solely due to that worker's work, as opposed to that worker now interacting with all these other workers and maybe they all uh, you know, contribute a fraction of the uh, new output and then they all contribute a fraction of the output that was happening before the new worker came in. You see what I'm saying? Like the new worker could come in and he's not just only solely working on that extra little bit of revenue. He's working on everything. So it's more like the whole value is now getting spread out among everyone else. And, and as a matter of accounting, as like capitalist business accounting, you can say, and then the totality of adding this guy, we get an extra a unit of, of revenue at the end. But that doesn't mean, again, like that he literally produced every bit of that extra unit of revenue. Like there's a sort of like metaphysical element to that, which is not true. They all did. All the workers did. So you can't like really go in and identify exactly how much of the output came from each worker. It's not, it's simply simply not possible. The other thing is, there are a lot of things in, um, there are a lot of ways that the economy works, especially a capitalist economy, which these individuals tend to be uh, uh, favorable to, that just clearly push against the idea that you are getting exactly what you produce back. So one a very obvious example of this is price swings, right? So you could be producing the exact same thing that you were producing last year. But if the market for that product has softened, then the price for that product will soften and your wage might go down, right? But not because you're producing any more or any less than you used to produce. You're producing exactly what you were before, the exact amount of widgets in the exact amount of factory, but now your income is lower. So how does that work? Now, I mean, I get how it works from a like market perspective, but from a labor dessert perspective, how can the same person be producing the exact same thing year after year after year and yet have their wage change so dramatically based on market conditions? And one very telling example of this is what's called uh, the ball mall effect. Um, and this is a kind of a special case of, uh, uh, of the change of price. Uh, that uh, how people can get paid more without becoming more productive. Okay, so let's talk. Let's read about the ball mall effect. <laughs> 
In economics, the Baumol effect, also known as Baumol's cost disease, is the rise of wages and jobs that have experienced little or no increase in labor productivity in response to rising salaries and other jobs that have experienced higher productivity growth. The rise of wages and jobs without productivity gains derives from the requirement to compete for workers with jobs that have experienced productivity gains and so can naturally pay higher salaries just as classical economics predicts. For instance, if the retail sector pays its managers low wages, they may decide to quit and get jobs in the automobile sector where wages are higher because of higher labor productivity. Thus, retail managers' salaries increase not due to labor productivity increases in the retail sector, but due to productivity and corresponding wage increases in other industries. Right? And the Baumol effect, usually people talk about it in the context of healthcare and education, right? So a teacher is a good example of this. Uh, teaching technology has not really, uh, teachers have not become like more productive over the years, right? So if you go into a, a kindergarten class or whatever, you might have one teacher teaching, I don't know, 13 students, whatever it might be, right? And that teacher, you know, if, you, if you've gone and you could go talk to, you know, 50-year-old teachers who've been doing this their whole life, they've been teaching 13 students every year for 30 straight years, they're like their productivity hasn't really changed. They produce 13 units of education supplied to these 13 people, but their wages are going up and up and up. Now, I know people will go, I don't know, not our teachers, whatever. But in general, right, wages in the education sector and the health sector rise alongside wage growth in the economy generally. And the reason for that is because even though a teacher is not producing more education, Right? They're still just producing 13 kids worth of education each year in the example before. In order to keep them in that classroom, you got to make sure that other sectors can't come in and poach them. Right? So in other sectors where they are having productivity gains, like in the example in the Wikipedia, they use the automobile sector. So let's say automobiles production is becoming way more efficient, and so they're able to pay their wages way more money than they used to. Well, you got to stop the teacher from just quitting and going to work for in a car factory, right? And the only way to keep that teacher from quitting and going to work in a car factory or any other sector where wages are rising because of productivity growth is to pay them as much as the auto worker makes. So the teacher's wage increases because the auto worker wages increase, but the teacher's productivity did not increase at all. So if we're going back to this notion of labor productivity where we say to each according to their production, then the teacher's wages are ill-gotten. And in fact, wages across the whole economy are ill-gotten because all of the <laughs> wages are being determined by like wages in other sectors and productivity gains in other sectors and productivity gains across the entire economy, right? Wage setting is not based on how much you personally produce. It's based upon this, at least partially based upon this competitive dynamic of how much people are making in other sectors. So you have, like I said before, in health and education, these are sectors where wages go up and up and up and up every year along with uh, general economic growth, even though productivity is completely flat. So workers get more money without more productivity. And if they're getting more money without increasing their productivity, then that must mean someone else is not getting money that they should be getting, right? Because if overall output is increasing in the economy, that must be attributable to specific workers that are becoming more productive or, or other factors of production. And if teachers and, and healthcare workers are getting more money despite be not becoming more productive, then that means that people who are becoming more productive are kind of like getting a raw deal, I guess, like under a labor dessert model. But the point here in pointing this out is not to say, oh, these people are getting off wrong. I think the whole premise of this is silly, right? The point is just to point out that the wages are not being determined by your own individual productivity, even when, you know... Even when you're a very productive worker, <laughs> the amount you get paid is often driven by productivity gains in other sectors that you have no play in, just because of the way the competitive market dy dynamics play out. So how can you say, well, I should get a, be able to keep all this because I earned it? You're doing the same work you were doing 10 years ago. Did you earn it? I don't know. Did anyone earn it? It's, it's kind of a silly proposition. Again, why, why I say you will not find too many intellectual defenders of this view, though it is, I would say, the by far dominant uh, view among regular people about, you know, why redistribution is bad and why the welfare state is bad and why, you know, egalitarian politics is misguided and in fact a form of theft, you know. <laughs> um.
The other thing here is there's a kind of circularity, and this applies to all of this. So, so far I've gone input to input to input to input, and I've just showed you that each one of these inputs don't comport with our notion of paying each person what they produce, right? But we can also talk about the whole the system as a whole. And there's a kind of like circularity here where the amount of money that you get out of the economy. We like to sometimes distinguish between the amount of money you get from the market and we go, that's my money. I earned that. And I've just discussed how that's that's not true, right? You didn't earn like most of this money's unearned or it's kind of random in some way. I earned that. But then the amount of money I get from like government benefits. That's like a distortion on the amount I get from the market. Now the government is intervening. It's stepping in to move around the distribution. This is the, 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 the amount you get from the market. That's the non-governmental amount. That's the amount that I got that we just get from trading and selling, and, we, and, and that makes sure you only get what you earn, right? But then you get food stamps and whatever, and that's not what you earned. That is not what, right? The problem is that the amount you get from the market is itself a function of government policy, right? And I used to describe this. <laughs> I used to have a slogan I would use for this, which was that the economy is a government program. And, and what I mean by that is simply that the economy and the structure of the economy, including the, the way the markets are structured, is, them, is itself a creation of the state. And depending on decisions you make about how to shape the market, that's also going to de determine how market wages and market income itself is distributed. So the government doesn't just distribute welfare income or social insurance income or transfer payments or whatever you want to call it. It's not like the government just sits over here, taxes some people, and then gives the money to others. In constructing the market itself, the government is determining how money is flowing inside the market or at least is having a massive effect on that, right? So some good examples of this would be um, look at the difference between the United States and the Nordic countries. In the United States, wage setting is done on a very individualized basis. There are some unions, certainly, but for the most part, a worker and an employer, they have to reach some kind of individual agreement with one another. That's how the structure of wage setting works. If you go to a Nordic economy, uh, the wage setting is established by worker organizations and employer organizations, right? So in the U.S., it's, you know, one worker and one employer, in theory. Right now, of course, the employer is itself a, and oftentimes an elaborate organization that has, you know, millions of shareholders and all this kind of stuff. But, but it's one employer, one uh, worker, and they come together and they strike some wage. You know, in practice, the employer just basically says, here's my wage, and the worker has to take it or leave it. There's not a whole lot of negotiation that goes on there uh, for most workers, for higher level workers, maybe. But for most workers, there's not a whole lot of negotiation that goes on there. But anyways, that's the U.S. kind of like wage setting model. One employer, one worker, they strike a wage. If you go to a Nordic economy, you have employer organizations, which is all the employers in a particular sector. Right, so you imagine all the grocery store companies, you know, Kroger, Walmart, Albertsons, Trader Joe's, whatever, they come together in an organization, right, in a grocery store employer organization. And then all the workers in the grocery stores, they come together in a grocery store worker organization. And so now you have an employer organization and a worker organization, and they collectively strike a deal about what the wages are going to be in that sector, right? And these are just different ways of structuring wage setting. One worker, one employer, or all the employers in one sector and all the workers in one sector reaching a collective agreement. Different ways of doing it, right? And I don't know, one is any more like uh, legitimate than the other in some kind of philosophical sense, but they have very big impacts on the distribution of wages, right? So the gap between like the lowest paid worker in uh, the Nordic economy or like say the 10th percentile worker and the 90th percentile worker is about half the gap in the U.S. So what they do is they shrink the wages and that has to do with the way that they've set up their wage setting institutions. That has to do with essentially how the labor market has been constructed in part by the state. And so how do we say, like, <laughs> what is the legitimate wage? Is it the, is it the wage that you get out of a one employer, one worker bargaining system? Or is it, a, is it a wage that you get out of an employer organization and a worker organization bargaining kind of economy? Because the wages differ dramatically, even for the exact same job, 
just based on how the bargaining structure is set up. So which is the true wage? Which is the wage that, that's my work. Is it the case that uh, the grocery store worker in the US who's gonna get paid a lot less than the grocery store worker in say uh, Sweden? Is it the case that he, that's the real wage and the Swedish worker is, a, is essentially stealing from other people, getting more than he deserves or is it the reverse? And the answer is none of the above, right? Like it's just a consequence of how you construct the labor market. There's no, here's your real true wage. It's, it's a policy choice. And it's a policy choice, not just in uh, establishing taxes and benefits, but also in establishing the market itself, right? So there's a kind of circularity to being like, whatever the market produces, the government shouldn't come in and then muck around with. The government's already mucked around that to make the market in the first place. The government's involved through the whole process. So you got to let the government do the thing, right? If, if they can set the market, they also should be able to set rules that pertain to taxes and transfers and other things that uh, help establish the income distribution. Um, the other places you could see stuff like this is uh, intellectual property. So the people who make really high incomes in our society, one, one group of people that do, the, do this, that's nominally labor, is in entertainment and sports, which is a kind of entertainment, right? Um, so, you know, movies, TV, uh, sports, uh, radio, uh, I don't know, podcasts, uh, YouTubers uh, to some extent, though not me uh, at this point, um, they can make tremendous amounts of income. And the reason they can make tremendous amounts of income is because of the way we have set up copyright laws in the US. You don't have to have copyright laws, and if you didn't have copyright laws, you wouldn't be able to make the kind of money you make producing content. And maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, I don't know, but it's, it's still a, a policy decision, right? It's hard to be like, well, I earned all this money from my YouTube channel, that's really my money. And it's like, mm, I mean, it, you know, in our system, because of the way IP law was established, sure, but we could weaken IP law uh, or do away with IP law altogether, and then you wouldn't make that money, and then, and then what? What are you owed exactly, right? That market is so heavily structured by the state, um, and so it's silly again to be like, that's my money, I made that money. I made, I, 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 I sang the song, and then I recorded it, and it went out on radio, and then so I earned a bunch of money. It's like all that is built on IP law. You get, and we saw this in the, in the context of music because when people started pirating music, revenue into the sector plummeted. The amount of revenue going into the music sector plummeted and people ultimately had to take quite a bit of a haircut in the music sector because of pirating. Now they've kind of figured out to, you know, a different model with these subscriptions and that kind of thing. But even still, revenue is not what it used to be. And so we saw there in real time that the amount of money that you're able to earn is to dependent on the intellectual property regime and, and, of course, in that case, the enforceability of the intellectual property regime, which is itself uh, constructed by the government. So, again, the amount of money you get as a worker is still conditioned by the system. It's not external to the system. Okay. So, you know, that's basically it. I mean, one last thing, and I've tried to... Uh, save this to the end because I don't want this to be the big point because a lot of people, this is the point that they will make. And I think it's a mistake to lead with this point because it's a slightly different point. Anyways, the point is this, where you wind up here, how much capital you wind up with, what nature you happen to own, if you own any land or natural resources, and indeed what job you happen to get into, right? Among the 150 million of them that are out there, the one that you happen to land in is very very luck-based. There's a lot of luck that goes into it. The reason I don't like to lead with that point is because I think, it's, I think it is possible for someone to say, look, I don't care what kind of luck goes into it. My point is not that there's no luck involved. My point is that wherever you wind up, you should get what you produce. You should get what you earn. Maybe it's unfair that some people wind up in very productive jobs and other people wind up in less productive jobs, but I don't really care about that. What I care is that each person gets what they produce. And we can separately try to tackle this problem of how people get sorted into one job or the other. That's, I think, a, a position someone uh, could take. And so what I did up to this point in the video is to say, okay, let's just take that for granted. Let's just imagine I don't care about the luck involved and where you wind up in the economy. Let's just look at the economy itself. Do capitalist income distributions, do market income distributions track any notion of each person getting what they produce? No, absolutely not. No one produces nature. These guys are deads. These guys don't work. And this shit's all over the map, right? Um, 
But I do think it's a fair enough point that one of the moral intuitions that make people favor the idea that you should work for what you earn and you should get what you earn is this idea that there is like a level playing field and that people get to go out and if you work hard, you can succeed and how much you succeed is based on how hard you work. And so I, it, I think it is important to undercut that intuition a little bit and say that's not strictly true. <laughs> it's not even remotely true, right? There's a lot of luck that goes into who's willing to hire you, not to mention the acquisition of skills, what colleges you get into, all sorts of life circumstances can occur, uh, deaths of family members at inopportune times. There's a lot of shit that goes on in a person's life that's outside of their control that determines where they wind up in the economy. And I think um, if you're someone who is inclined to kind of say, I want people to work hard and get what they work for, I think understanding that there is so much luck involved and where you wind up, I think it does undercut the idea that, yeah, we should keep this system in place. And even if it creates horrific inequality, uh, that, that that's okay because everyone, you know, had their chance and everyone wound up wherever uh, they were supposed to based on their, uh, how hard uh, they worked. That's not true. Hard work certainly comes into where you wind up, but there's also a shitload of luck that determines where you wind up. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, that's basically it. Like I said, I think a dozen times now, I do not think that this viewpoint has a lot of intellectual adherence, but it is, I would say, the uh, predominant kind of folk philosophical position. And it just, it does not scan. Um, our economy does not distribute income in accordance to how much you produce. Um, and... That's one reason why you should reject efforts to pattern the distribution that way. It's impossible to pattern the distribution that way. And even if you were to try, it certainly wouldn't look anything like capitalism or, or market income distributions that we see in America. It wouldn't look anything like that. Um, and so this doesn't in and of itself say, well, therefore you should be an egalitarian. Maybe you have some other intuitions. But I think it at least get you one step closer to understanding why someone might be an egalitarian, right? Even this alone, and I, I know I'm going a little long here, even this alone, because this is really the big one, the fact that it is accumulated technology, accumulated knowledge and innovation that we've added up over thousands and thousands of years, the fact that that is really like the main thing that drives how much we produce should kind of totally obliterate any notion of deservingness. I don't deserve to have been born at a time where all of this information and all of this innovation had, has already been accumulated and therefore it's very easy to just produce massive amounts of stuff that no one, I don't deserve that. And for someone to be like, ah, oh, it's okay for that per that it's okay that this person is poor, that that kid is hungry, uh, because I I went out and I worked and I produced all this bull fucking shit. The vast majority of any person's paycheck is coming from technological inputs that they did not produce, and that in fact the person who produced them is fucking dead. That's the reality. And I think once you start to recognize that a little bit, it does get you down the path of being like, yeah, we should probably just try to keep things pretty equal. Like, we're all pretty lucky. We all kind of got this big gift given to us, which is this massively productive economy, which primarily comes from inputs of innovation and stuff. We kind of all got really lucky here, and so we should kind of share it and not invent these arguments about why I should get a hundred times more than some other person gets when clearly I did not contribute a hundred times more than some other person contributed because realistically I contributed almost nothing, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm like a little bit of a input at the very end of a long chain of technological development, right? So anyways, subscribe, like, hit the bell, do all that shit. i um, getting close to 3,000 subscribers. I'm going to try to do more of these uh, interested in your comments. So please do leave them.